Well, for those of you that arrived late, uh, you may be wondering where Jim Stone is. He is not behind the podium. Uh, I am taking his stead. He had to go away for a family emergency. So I will be speaking today uh, in the words of my seven-year-old, awkward. I have to uh, introduce myself. Um, I am uh, Eric Peifel. Uh, I'm an orthopedic uh, surgeon who has a specialty in uh, sports medicine. Uh, I am board certified in both orthopedics and orthopedic sports medicine. I did my undergraduate uh, training at The Ohio State University as well. Uh, my medical college at Medical College of Ohio at Toledo. My residency here at the Medical College of Wisconsin and then fellowship in orthopedic sports medicine back at Ohio State. Um, I'll be uh, discussing uh, common fall sports injuries. About 70% of my practice is now hip, uh, hip injuries in the athlete, so today I'll be discussing shoulder and ankle injuries. <laughs> and with that, uh, we will proceed. Um, fall sports, uh, around here, there are many fall sports, but the majority of them that most schools have include cross country for both boys and girls, volleyball, soccer for uh, men, and football. Certainly there are many others. Uh, the, these all have injuries. They all cross uh, uh, each sports, the injuries cross, but we're going to focus on some of the more common injuries in these sports in this part of the country. Lower extremity injuries, certainly these are the ones that are main, uh, mainly problems for the cross country athlete, endurance athlete, also see it in the distance runners during the spring season for track. And these are, include both acute and chronic injuries. These happen both in uh, non-endurance athletes as well, it's just not as common. We also will have acute injuries. These are not as common in uh, cross country, but much more common in collision or contact sports as soccer, football, and sometimes volleyball are, as well as some of the other fall sports that you all take care of. Soft tissue injuries uh, occur in every type of sport, depending on twists and turns, and kind of go across all bounds of sport. So we'll start with some chronic stress injuries and much more common in the repetitive athlete, endurance athlete. These occur both in the bone or soft tissue and are related to repetitive stresses in which the body does not have a time to recuperate. In the lower extremity, these are typically due to weight bearing and these sometimes can become chronic conditions that are difficult to reverse. Tendonitis is one of these. Uh, this occurs due to chronic overload of the tendon, uh, usually with eccentric forces, uh, in which there's a repetitive aggravation of the tissue that diminishes the ab ability for that tissue to repair during the season especially. Uh, if these go on long enough where there's enough injury, this can become catastrophic where it's no longer microtrauma becomes macrotrauma, including rupture of tendons. This is uncommon in the teenage athlete, but does occur. Uh, typically, this uh, begins with localized pain and tenderness to palpation. This can occur with any tendon of the lower extremity. Uh, this can occur with the hip flexors, quads, patellar tendons, and all of these above. How do you treat these? Uh, well, we all treat these. Why? These are the things that we see, especially with athletes that go from nothing to everything, go from transitioning from a hard court to soft court, uh, go from an uh, athlete that's transitioning from a, a pickup game type of level to an accelerated level, to a collegiate level, to professional level. So we all see these. It's the standard start, the rest. So changing, mod uh, changing activities, ice, anti-inflammatories, if there are abnormalities, especially in the lower extremities, especially with runners, considering some type of realignment, either through orthotics, uh, braces, and then if those are not working or not working sufficiently, discussion of surgery to realign the lower extremities appropriately. What surgeries are helpful for when it uh, comes to tendon tendonitis? Um, debridement can uh, be helpful in some situations depending on the extent of the uh, injury. Uh, this can include the Achilles, uh, the patellar tendon. Uh, this is done by tenotomy or uh, repetitive puncture. 
Um, there is some role, although highly controversial, that we'll not get into because that would take three to four hours today on PRP, but certainly something reasonable to consider, at least discuss, especially with your higher level athletes. Stress injury not related to soft tissue, but in the bone. These also occur in your endurance athletes as well. Acute fracture is a result from a single loading event across the bone in which the uh, tissue is unable to sustain those forces and it is, uh, goes through the tissue and breaks. Uh, this is when that stress exceeds the strength of the bone. Unlike a true or an acute fracture, stress fractures are an accumulation of those traumas and forces over a period of time in which the body has not had that time to repair itself, get it back to its fair, uh, previous state, and becomes, st starts to break down, creating inflammation, creating pain, and giving uh, potentially some difficulties to your especially endurance athletes. In uh, cross country, this is a high risk. Why? You go through a summer where many of the athletes are not running or not running to the extent that they are. They are thrown into a situation where everyone's running, uh, especially athletes that run year round, and they go into a repetitive ag aggravation of the lower extremities for long durations at paces they're not used to and especially distances they are not used to and especially their bones are not used to. Difficulty with cross country and stress fractures is these come on insidiously. So they might have some aches and pains where they push them off to aches or muscles or they're just sore because they're starting to do things uh, in a different fashion that they used to, but then they can get to a, a dangerous uh, level. Uh, typically at first they improve with rest, although it may not be immediately after uh, activity, it may be a few hours, and then it worsens over time if this pain persists in which they begin to have shin pain, thigh pain, groin pain, all that can be concerns for stress fractures, especially in your endurance athletes, especially in your thin female endurance athletes. So on physical exam, when you're seeing these patients in the training room in the office, you want to consider the appearance of the extremity. Is there a difference side to side? So the great thing for orthopod is that we typically have a uh, secondary side to use as a normal. Um, joint range of motion sometimes can be limited depending on where the pain is, if it's within the shaft of the bone or within the joint, and oftentimes can create pain and oftentimes there'll be tenderness to palpation over a uh, centered area, but oftentimes it's, it's even worse than that. It's in a diffuse area with a central point of, of maximal tenderness. Physical exam is oftentimes, uh, especially in the training room where you don't have imaging uh, modalities for the most part, the best way to differentiate between soft tissue and bony abnormalities as Usually there is tenderness, but typically joint motion is not painful with soft tissue injury, but not always the case. The most common problem between uh, differentiating between shin pain is due to soft tissue overuse. Uh, so shin splints or uh, uh, periostitis, uh, which can be difficult, does happen in endurance athletes, but does not have the potential ramifications of becoming a true fracture like a stress fracture does of the tibia. The um, difficulty is they oftentimes present very similarly and in many people, many people actually believe this is on the continuum where you begin with shin splints and it extends into a true stress fracture, although that may, is a little bit controversial. So what do you do to help out? Well, once you're beyond the training room, once you've come to the office or seen your primary care doctor, what do you do? Uh, Every person that comes in my office gets an x-ray when they're a new patient or have a new complaint. Why? It is a low cost modality to save my backside, but also to give them some ideas of what may be or may not be going on. It can rule as many things out as it can rule in. Bone scans can be helpful as well. So we start with x-rays. So on x-ray we have uh, stress fractures that may uh, behave differently depending on the sites. One of the more common places is along the uh, tibial shaft, which this arrow is uh, pointing to on the, along the anterior shaft, in which there's this consolidation of uh, bone along the anterior cortex. Um, if this is a stress fracture here, uh, this is going to create shin pain, 
it may not create the big achiness pain that you may get in the base of the fifth metatarsal. There are three stretches of stress fracture that we can see on x-rays. Um, this includes crack initiation, which is a, the dreaded black uh, line, propagation in which that black line becomes more than a millimeter or two and extends across the bone, and then ultimate structural failure which, in which a stretch fracture transforms into an acute fracture and oftentimes surgical management is necessary. Predisposing factors for stress fractures are uh, the th same things we talked about as, cross, as far as cross-country runners. Uh, patients who have abnormal alignment, uh, varus or valgus uh, knees, uh, flat-footedness, uh, and aversion of the hips, oftentimes a combination of all these as they develop together sometimes uh, can increase that because the stresses are much different than the more normally aligned patient. Uh, patients with decreased vascularity or uh, vascular disorders, older age, especially due to the lack of blood supply, poor nutrition, hormonal imbalance, including female triad syndrome, and then genetic factors beyond that. Stress fractures, much like stress reactions or shin splits, uh, come on insidiously in which you have pain over a specific area and worsens with activities. It improves with rest, but if it is a true stress fracture, except in the very, very early stages, it never typically goes away immediately. Uh, as it gets worse, the amount of pain as well as the length of pain uh, uh, as far as lasting after activity increases. Stress fractures oftentimes manifest just like we talk about in transitioning sports, but also may occur in people that change uh, occupations, and these are also known as march fractures in uh, folks who go into the military, in which they increase their activities with high loads at high pace when they're not used to it. So in a patient who has a stress fracture, you want to consider the many things as far as treatment, uh, those are not just uh, diminishing sporting activities, but hopefully creating a balance on how to proceed so they don't have these again, or if they get them again, they know how to deal with them appropriately. This includes nutritional status, especially in female athletes, especially female endurance athletes that may become amenorrheic, have the female triad syndrome, which puts their bones at, uh, at um, um, risk for stress fracture. Patients who have hormonal uh, abnormalities uh, beyond the female triad may be at risk and having that worked up may be appropriate, especially in a patient who has had multiple stress fractures. Current medications, uh, some antibiotics and some other medications may diminish the body's uh, ability to repair and may be involved if this is a, a new onset of uh, pain right after beginning a medication and the female triad of amenorrhea, disordered eating, and osteoporosis push those patients at risk. Tenderness certainly is over the fracture site. Uh, this is oftentimes uh, manifested with swelling, and that certainly is dependent on the location. It's easy in the tibia, which has minimal subcutaneous tissue, uh, and on, uh, much more difficult in the thigh or femoral shaft uh, stress fracture uh, due to the girth of musculature even in the thinnest patient. Uh, typically, there is full joint range of motion unless this is intraarticular, especially if uh, uh, femoral neck stress fracture. And uh, muscle tone and function are typically normal where you may see them diminished in tendonitis as th that is part of the feedback loop. Shin splints is a, a much uh, lesser uh, problem uh, when it comes to catastrophic injury. Uh, but certainly is a, a difficult thing to deal with with your endurance athlete uh, as uh, it can diminish their ability to run, it can diminish their ability to walk. Uh, this is a poorly defined uh, irritation, typically felt to be of the periosteum or lining of the bone. Uh, some people feel, as I spoke earlier, that this may be on the continuum uh, down the line to stress fractures. Um, this is typically on the anterior medial or posterior medial aspect of the tibia with activities and increases with um, distance um, activities, but also along the border of the tibia. Um, uh, he's put on here, this is not actually bone tenderness. Well, if you can tell me how to differentiate between the periosteum and bone, I will, uh, I will give you a dollar. 
Um, the soleus insertion is a concerning spot for periostitis or shin splints, uh, but is not the only uh, thing that is involved. Typically, x-rays are negative, other than you may see some soft tissue shadowing if you have enough uh, zoom quality on your x-rays to be able to see the soft tissue shadow overlying the tibia. Bone scans and MRIs will be positive, uh, but typically don't show significant intraosseous uh, changes. X-rays, as we spoke earlier, you discussed the um, difficulty with, or the uh, um, uh, dreaded black line which you see right here with these arrows. And in this person, it's showing up in multiple sites, which is very uncommon, or a longitudinal stress fracture. Um, X-rays at the beginning of stress, uh, X-rays at the beginning may be negative, and that is the downside. So if you have a clinical suspicion, especially in the office, especially as a physician or extender, where you're seeing a patient, your brain's telling you it's a stress fracture, the X-rays are telling you to not, consider, especially in areas of high risk like the femoral neck, getting another type of Im imaging modality to make sure that this is not a, a catastrophic event for your athlete. Bone scans are high sensitivity with low specificity. Um, it's great to show this big blossom of uh, changes uh, that you're seeing on this side view of the tibia where you have all this excess uh, uptake right across there. It'll tell you that it's a stress fracture, you think, but it also could be some other things that are causing osseous changes. So if you have any concern beyond anything besides a stress fracture, or, and you have a patient who can tolerate an MRI and is, doesn't have any contraindications, uh, get an MRI, at least in my brain. MRIs much, has a much higher sensitivity, and like I said, it has a much uh, easier ability to look at other etiology for pain that does occur in endurance athletes, including tumors, including uh, masses. It can show periostitis, which may not show up as well on bone scan. And all in all, I think it is a reasonable study. It is not that different in cost when you break it down for your patient. Um, and it, it may be finding something else besides a stress fracture for you. Stress fractures, uh, there are different types, and depending on the location within the body, uh, things to be considered. Fractures that are on the compression side of the joint, so the undersurface of the femoral neck, um, have a tendency to be more stable and will have a tendency to unite without some type of surgical intervention. Ones that are on the tension side, oops, tension side uh, oftentimes will progress, uh, often need to be fixed uh, or have some type of fixation across in order to maintain the alignment so it doesn't become something more catastrophic like a displaced femoral neck stress fracture. Tibial, stress, uh, fra tibial shaft stress fractures are a uh, large component of stress fractures we see in all patients. Um, they oftentimes will occur on the posterior medial or compression side and these are typically lower risk and typically you can be treated non-operatively, especially when caught early, especially when caught when there is not a dreaded black line. On the anterior aspect of the tibial diaphyseal region, uh, this is a tension side for the, the majority of our activities, and this is high risk. And unless you have a significant compliant patient and there is very minimal changes on x-ray, at least a consideration of intermedullary rotting should take place. Femoral neck stress fractures are the ones that drive me the craziest uh, because typically these are in endurance athletes, typically they're in female athletes, and I have to rule out about 100 other things for patients that are coming to see me because I deal with so much hip pathology. Uh, oftentimes in the early stages, the x-rays are normal. Uh, however, if you have concern, it would be bad to break your tibia. It would hurt like heck. It would be bad to get a rod. But the truth is, it's much better to do that than to break your femoral neck because the risk of AVN with a fractured and displaced femoral neck, it can be catastrophic for day-to-day -day life, let alone endurance. Uh, athletes. So these are the ones that make me just tense up a little bit more when I have an athlete that comes in, they have horrible, horrible groin pain. It came out of the blue 
And if I get an x-ray that doesn't show much, I am putting them on crutches and I'm saying it's a stress fracture until determined otherwise. And in fact, I did that three times last week. So those people are not happy with you. Those athletes are not happy with you. But if you catch one out of 10, it, they will be much happier than having a uh, hip replacement at age 20. Um, bone scans and MRIs, I think, are reasonable. The same, same logic comes to this. I am going to probably get an MRI to look for other pathology uh, because if it is not a stress fracture, I don't want to say it's not a stress fracture. Now let's get the MRI. Um, Certainly, just like we spoke in the tibia, we want uh, to worry about the tension side. The tension side in the femoral neck is the superior aspect here. And you can see on here that this patient has already developed a little bit of stress fracture across there. Um, the tension side, we've got to worry about non-union or not healing, uh, becoming a completed fracture and that risk of AVN or avascular necrosis. <clears throat> Compression side or the undersurface, uh, typically, we do not need to go through something like this. Uh, there is still intermediate risk because these can propagate. It can go to those second and third stages like we discussed earlier with stress fractures. And um, you can sometimes get away with these with limited weight bearing if you have a patient that you can trust, that you have good knowledge of, uh, minimal propagation or uh, x-ray linear uh, changes. Uh, but uh, sometimes you do have to go on to uh, fixation if you think you have a patient who's going to be non-compliant and uh, go on to AVN or concerns of AVN. Patellar strax fractures are uncommon, uh, but they do occur in endurance athletes as well. Um, these are high risk because the tensions across the patella, especially a transverse stress fracture, longitudinal stress fractures do occur, but they're uncommon. Uh, these typically occur in the watershed area of uh, blood supply within the mid portion of the patella or central zone. If they're non-displaced, you oftentimes can cut down on activities, uh, brace them in immobilization or cast them, and uh, they will heal. The blood supply there is reasonable, much better than the femoral neck. Uh, however, if there's any concern for displacement, uh, you don't want your patients to lose their extensor mechanism or displace into the interarticular surface behind the patella and displace or get irritation of the cartilage. So ORAF should be considered in any of those transverse fractures. Fibular shaft fractures are, are common in uh, runners as well, especially in patients with uh, flat footedness because of the loads that are placed on the lateral aspect of the foot. Um, these are typically within the five centimeter region around the tip of the fibula. They're low risk, why the fibula is a strut only and does not help or is not uh, adamantly involved in all activities. Um, typically, these will respond to non operative treatment if given appropriate time. Calcaneal stress fractures do occur as well, uh, especially in uh, change in shoe or change in uh, running technique. Um, and these do occur in the mil military personnel as well. Um, these are low risk for propagating into uh, true fractures just due to the sheer density of the calcaneus as it's one of the most dense bones in the body besides the jaw. Uh, and this is a linear change within that. Uh, certainly uh, younger athletes that come in, you want to make sure you're differentiating between apophysitis or Seaver's disease. Uh, but stress fractures like this typically will respond to non-operative treatment, non-weight bearing status, alteration in shoe wear, and uh, um, orthotics. Navicular stress fractures more common in jumping athletes uh, just due to the loads across the midfoot. So volleyball players, basketball players will see this much more frequently. These are higher risk injuries uh, due to the poor density of the bone across here typically. Um, and Oftentimes, uh, we need to shut the uh, patient down for a significant amount of their season uh, for these. If it's non-displaced, if it's displaced, then we get up to our foot and ankle specialist uh, to fix them to allow them to proceed appropriately. And here's one that uh, has begun to propagate and would have gone on to surgery due to the displacement. Uh, I don't think that the majority of athletes could tolerate not getting this fixed and it may also, in fact, need some bone grafting across there. Fifth metatarsal stress fracture is much more common in um, jumping athletes as well. Uh, stress fractures, especially uh, basketball players, uh, it's typically in the watershed area of poor blood supply. 
uh, across the diametaphyseal region that's shown on the x-ray here. Uh, so you can either get stress fractures or you can get acute fractures in this area, both which uh, heal very poorly, especially if there's any type of displacement. Uh, the sclerosis that you see around the outside of the fracture may be an indicator this has been going on for a while. The body's been trying to heal it and it's not making it there. So you may have to go on to uh, surgery, including a uh, percutaneous screw, typically, with a, a bone graft. All right, enough for stress fractures. Stress injuries uh, beyond that, that can occur in endurance athletes, but can occur in all athletes that do repetitive running, including soccer players, including volleyball, including football. Chronic compartment syndrome is defined by an elevated uh, pressure within the uh, fascia of the uh, muscle um, in which it extends or compresses the musculature to a point where perfusion of the tissues by blood supply is diminished and can potentially be detrimental to the uh, muscular tissue. Acute uh, compartment syndrome is not what we're talking about. This is a young man from Alabama who is scoring, I believe, against Florida, Dr. Zoltan. And uh, um, a, an acute injury like a tibial fracture like this, especially with the higher injury, uh, higher energy that we're seeing right here, may result in compartment syndrome of those musculatures. That's not due to repetitive activity. It's due to the acute swelling of the musculature uh, due to that injury at that moment. What we're talking about is loading the musculature until it's hypertrophying to a point where it has nowhere else to expand and diminish the potential for that blood supply to get to that musculature. And this typically is in endurance sports, but occurs in all sports. Um, it is oftentimes uh, occurs with exercise, and typically you'll see increased uh, compartment pressures. It is not a classic presentation of pain. It is more a diffuse, vague pain in which it, the, the athlete's going to come to the training room or to your office and say, I have this achiness, especially the early stages. It's very hard for them to pinpoint. It bothers me for a little bit. They can't really do timelines as well. And when you have these type of changes in your athletes, you really need to consider ruling out all other uh, things that could potentially cause this, including nerve entrapment, stress fractures, periostitis, because these oftentimes will overlap in the symptomatology that you'll see. If those are all negative, because they can potentially be more catastrophic, this is not an emergency like an acute apartment syndrome. If those are all negative, then you go on to the testing. And the reason you do that is one, you want to rule out the bad stuff, but two, you also don't want to put an athlete through compartment testing, although Dr. Edwards does a very nice job, is not exactly the greatest test on earth as we're poking with needles, make you run, and then checking again. Most people have a clinical presentation of pain that's increased by exertion and then relieved by rest, typically with some type of duration of rest after the activity before resolution of symptoms. They can describe a sensation of tightness or cramping, a uh, feeling of swelling, although they don't see swelling. And if this has gone on long enough or it's in a compartment that is very tight, numbness and tingling, although less common. This is a consistent pattern in which it occurs with activity and dissipates with inactivity. You have to consider these differentials as they may be more catastrophic, including uh, stress fractures, um, neurogenic claudication, if there's some type of vascular disease, nerve entrapment, infection or tumor. And typically in my athletes, if there's any concerns of swelling in the office, I am going to MRI them before I do any type of compartment testing. The um, way to confirm this is have a high clinical suspicion, rule out everything else, and then you need to confirm it typically for most surgeons to do anything surgically as far as release of this. And that involves direct measurement of the compartments of the uh, extremity. And this is much more common in the lower leg than upper leg than over the uh, upper extremities, but it does occur there as well depending on different types of sports. Non-operative treatment is typically not successful 
except in the very, very early stages in which you have a compliant patient that is going to shut everything down and take a significant time off. Um, you can try anti-inflammatories, orthotics, and activity modification. It typically doesn't work. I will try it. I will tell them it doesn't work, and they will still try it. Uh, I don't know if anyone else in the audience has any success with it, but I have never had success for any type of duration except in an athlete who's willing to give up endurance sports, which is very uncommon. The anatomy of chronic compartment syndrome of the lower leg, because that is the most common place here, involves uh, the cross-sectional view of the tibia, which you see here, and the fibula here, and the four, four compartments of the leg that I think is uh, seen a little bit uh, easier when we have there. So he's first defining anterior compartment here along the uh, lateral aspect of the tibia. The lateral compartment here along the lateral aspect of the fibula. The deep posterior, which is one of the more difficult ones to uh, check uh, because it is deep and it's near the vasculature and then the superficial posterior, which is the largest one and the least commonly involved due to the size of the compartment. So we need to look at the compartment pressures. Um, there are different criteria that you can use. Um, looking at athletes who have compartments and uh, pressures in each compartment greater or equal to 15 millimeters of mercury at rest uh, at least highly suspicious of the exertional compartment syndrome and thereafter based on these criteria. There are other criteria as well that you can uh, look to uh, with compartment testing um, and I'll leave that up to you what you use. I typically use the uh, uh, first uh, set of objective uh, compartment uh, measurements uh, but I don't do the testing anymore so I leave it up to my uh, partner Dr. Edwards. So what if these are elevated? Well, you can try the non-operative treatment. You can tell them not to do their activities, or you can uh, have them evaluated by a specialist who does fasciotomies. And a fasciotomy, uh, if you've not seen, is basically peeling the muscle and peeling the skin to allow for a greater amount of swell during activity. It is a very, fairly straightforward uh, procedure. It takes only a matter of a half hour, 45 minutes per leg. Uh, but it does have potential uh, ramifications including nerve injury, especially peripheral nerve injury because they're very close to the skin. Uh, they are uh, already a little bit flared up by the amount of uh, pressure. So this is a um, example of doing a compartment uh, release here with scissors, releasing the uh, anterior and lateral compartment as we're seeing right in between there and opening that up. The biggest issue is the superficial nerves run right along there. The posterior compartments can be released in a similar fashion and it is a fairly straightforward uh, procedure as long as nerves uh, are not injured, which is the most common complication other than recurrence. With that, we'll uh, travel on to the next uh, activity or next injury that is very common in the uh, fall sports season, including ankle injuries. This is common to all your athletes, not just your fall athletes, not just your volleyball and uh, basketball athletes. Inversion injury is the most common and it is the most common orthopedic injury uh, going to emergency departments. It is very common in uh, hard court activities and uh, activities in which there's twisting and turning but also in endurance sports especially cross country with undulating or uneven surfaces. The anatomy of the ankle uh, does show the uh, anterior talofibular ligament uh, which is the most commonly injured uh, right across here. The CFO or calcaneal fibular ligament uh, which is right here and the posterior talofibular ligament uh, which I don't believe oh, it is right across here. The ATFL is your primary restraint to inversion uh, during plantar flexion. It resists the anterior lateral translation of the talus in the mortise or the uh, housing of the uh, talus in the ankle. Uh, which is right across here. The CFL does uh, primarily restrain inversion in neutral or dorsiflexion of the ankle and it uh, restrains subtalar inversion and that's shown there with the red arrow. And the posterior talofibular ligament is the strongest and uh, least commonly injured 
um, and it is on the posterior aspect of the ankle and sometimes is involved in avulsion fractures in that area due to the strength of that uh, ligament. So positions of risk. Certainly an ankle sprain is not an ankle sprain is not an ankle sprain. And uh, this is becoming uh, more accepted by uh, patients as they hear about high ankle sprains. They hear about ankle sprains that involve the inside and outside. But it still is difficult because everyone, like my old baseball coach, tells them to walk it off. It's just an ankle sprain. So you oftentimes don't have to uh, counsel your patients that it's not the same as their buddy down the street, but sometimes you do. Uh, plantar flexion and inversion. Uh, injuries oftentimes uh, are at risk because the narrow uh, posterior aspect of the talus, uh, the weaker ligaments anteriorly uh, are put at risk uh, when you're put into plantar flexion and the failure uh, then occurs at the anterior capsule then followed by the ATFL then CFL in sequence. The majority of ankle sprains will at least have an involvement of the ATFL and then secondarily the CFL. Typically these are acute in nature. Um, most people can give the mechanism of injury. Unlike a lot of other injuries that occur on the field, most people can describe it. Uh, so they can tell you which way their foot was, which way uh, they were planting as they got injured. So that sometimes will help with mechanism of injury and location of injury. They sometimes will feel a pop or a tear, especially if this is their first event. On physical exam, you want to evaluate for swelling and ecchymosis, especially in the sinus tarsi and the lateral aspect of the ankle, uh, which you see right in here with the base of that thumb. Uh, tenderness, you want to check over the proximal uh, fibula to make sure there is not an extension of a syndesmotic injury. Uh, you want to check the distal fibula, especially in your skeletally immature patients as it most likely is a fracture rather than a ligamentous injury. And you also want to check the uh, distal tibia, especially in an immature athlete as that may be uh, fused with a non-displaced break of a distal tibial fracture. And check your syndesmosis with a squeeze test or a hop test. Typical ankle sprains or classic ankle sprains are ATFL sprains of the ATFL and potentially the CFL. There's not typically any swelling on the medial aspect, not typically any tenderness as you see in this athlete who has a lot of swelling laterally with the uh, hematoma or ecchymosis uh, pooling right along the heel. Red flags when it comes to ankle sprains. You really need to consider that if there's medial tenderness medial swelling, medial ecchymosis, that something else has on, gone on, either an injury to the deltoid ligamentous structures on the medial aspect of the tibia, or that there's some type of involvement of the syndesmosis in which that energy has propagated up the leg and out through the medial aspect of the ankle. Um, syndesmotic injuries are more concerning and we have to have a high suspicion, especially when you have medial sided pain or proximal pain. This is an x-ray showing on AP that the uh, ankle looks pretty normal. Normal contours of the mortise, uh, no fractures that can be seen. On a, uh, looks like a uh, mortise view here, there is some widening. And when you get an x-ray above this ankle x-ray and get a true tib fib x-ray, you, you see there is a proximal fibular shaft fracture, which means that the energy of the injury has traveled up through the ankle through the syndesmosis and out through here, uh, indicating that this is not a typical ankle sprain. It is not going to be the typical type of recovery and may need some type of surgical intervention, especially if you're going to have widening of the mortise here, as that may lead to incongruity and early degenerative changes. And that includes doing a syndesmotic screw, which he's showing here. This is a patient who has a widened mortise. Um, there is a pin placed across the distal fibula and tibia above the level of the joint line and the syndesmosis is reduced and maintained by screws which eventually are taken out to allow motion across there once the soft tissues have healed. Lateral ligaments uh, oftentimes can be treated by a brief period of immobilization, especially initial injury. Um, most patients can be weight bearing as tolerated depending on their symptoms and swelling Early mobilization taping uh, is the best treatment for the majority of the, these athletes and most can be taken care of in the training room or in therapy. 
Most people can return to sport with a typical ankle sprain at two to three weeks, some faster, some slower, um, especially if these are first events. A moderate sprain, four to six weeks, and severe sprains, especially syndesmotic sprains, uh, would be most likely up to three months or longer, depending on if there is a need for surgery. And last but not least, football. We've uh, touched on a lot of things that involve football, and certainly the fall season uh, does have a high incidence of football injuries, and a lot of our jobs go in to take care of those athletes. And this is one of the injuries that is almost uh, isolated to uh, football. And this is stingers or burners. There's a lot of names for this. And this is, a tip, uh, this is an injury to the brachial plexus in which the athletes feels a temporary stinging, burning, tingling of the arm. They have a dead arm. They come off shaking it like a loose goose. Uh, and they're not happy with where they are. Most of them will know what it is. Uh, sometimes the freshmen for the, have the first time and they get very uh, painful. Um, this is typically occurs when the head is forcefully bent to the side and that brachial plexus is stretched or pinched. And this uh, usually will last a few seconds or minutes, but some may last uh, for a longer duration. This is the mechanism uh, with this young man is getting uh, pinched back. And you can see in the smaller picture below how this could occur during tackling in which he's not using his head appropriately. He's using his shoulder and wrapping up. Uh, but what has happened is he's getting compression across that uh, brachial plexus. What happens, the anatomy of the uh, uh, neck is very important because this shows us why things get stretched out. What we're seeing is the cross-sectional anatomy of the spinal cord and the C-spine in which the dorsal root fibers or sensory fibers here, the ventral fibers or motor fibers which are here, and they jo join to uh, create the spinal root as it enters uh, along the anterior aspect uh, of the neck. As these are coming out, they have articular processes, and if there is a hyperextension and rotational injury, these get stretched and can give some irritation of the uh, nerve fibers, giving burning sensation, but sometimes some motor function difficulty. The typical mechanisms we discussed, but sometimes it is compression of that uh, soft tissue as it comes out of the spinal canal, the traction of being simultaneously uh, extending the arm and twisting the neck where you have a pulling or traction of the nerve or a direct blow, uh, which can occur if someone is getting tackled as well. And these typically can occur at C5, C6 as they are the ones uh, most exposed. Uh, there is some association between patients with spinal uh, stenosis as this increases the potential for impingement of the nerve during these type of injuries and those are in patients have a Pavlov uh, ratio less than 0.8. What is the history of the athlete that has this? There is a transient numbness that is very important. Uh, it is a weakness, electrical pain to the hand that lasts a few seconds or minutes and this should not say rarely neck pain, this should say no neck pain until proven otherwise. Uh, in my hands, if there's any neck pain, this is not a stinger. We need to worry about everything else first, and if everything else comes back negative, it is a stinger. So neck pain rules out stinger until I have done that when I'm doing my on-field assessment. Um, as we said, patient comes off uh, shaking that arm like a noodle. Uh, you about, need to make sure that you're checking the neck to make sure there's active and passive range of motion, no tenderness along the bony structures, no significant tenderness along the paraspinal musculature. Uh, you got to make sure there's no other abnormalities like AC joint separation, clavicle fracture that could also mimic this as those could compress along the brachial plexus as well. Uh, make sure there's a, you have a good sensory exam so you can get a baseline after the injury and progressively check that through the, case, through the, uh, the game. Uh, check especially the upper uh, trunk, which has C5, C6, so checking your deltoid and biceps, and then checking your lower trunk or the ulnar nerve distribution of the hand. And, and you also want to give it a baseline of strength at that time because that's one of the determinations whether or not they're going to go back. If you have any suspicion of neck injury, it is not a stinger. Don't classify it as it. It'll, we'll figure that out later. Uh, they should be immobilized, transported, and get x-rays. Uh, Flexion extension views are something down the line once everything else has been ruled out. MRIs are reasonable if uh, symptoms persist 
and uh, there is neck pain along with this. EMG nerve conduction study may be necessary down the line, but not typically. Um, management is rest. Patients can return to sport if they're pain-free, has full passive and active motion, and has full strength as well as full sensory uh, um, of the upper extremity. The only point that I will do, uh, say to that is if they have repetitive stingers in the same game, I will not return them. Um, you've got to make sure you're distinguishing between per peripheral nerve injury and cord injury, and we've already gone through that. This is a uh, logarithm, how to go through this. What I would tell you is if there's neck pain, if the answer is yes, you mobilize them, they're out of sport, and then you move on. If the answer is no neck pain, then you evaluate the extremities. If it's bilateral, it's not a stinger. If it's unilateral and it's resolving, it's most likely a stinger, and you can use the return to play criteria we discussed. Transient quadriplegia is a much more concerning and fairly horrific uh, thing to see on the field. If you've never seen it, uh, you will be very scared the first time, and preparing yourself ahead of time uh, is very helpful for that. Um, this is where an athlete's going to have pain, tingling, loss of sensation in both sides, the upper and or lower extremities, and can occur in all four at the same time. And it is not a true injury to the spinal cord, but aggravation of the spinal cord. Um, and we need to treat it like a neck injury on the field, and we'll figure things out uh, down the line once they've had the appropriate workup. With that, I will thank you for listening to Jim Stone's talk and me translating it. And